politics of, by, and for the people. Presented as a public service by the members of the American labor movement in your city. This is the first of a series of programs. The primary purpose of the series is to stimulate citizen interest and activity in our local, state, and national political life. It's intended in the main for the members of trade unions, although millions of Americans will feel, as they should, that the interests and objectives of organized working people are inseparable from their own. Government in a democratic society is essentially a means of helping people to do things which they want to do or to have done, but which they cannot do or have done as individuals. Obviously, not all desired ends are identical. There is conflict in most societies. Conflict is between individuals and as between groups. Our first constitutional convention, for example, was sharply divided even over the Bill of Rights, which many representatives of the economically privileged groups of that day, it was 1787, didn't want to extend to ordinary citizens. It wasn't until 1791 that the Bill of Rights was actually adopted, and it was many decades later before its provisions were generally observed. Our national history is a history of conflicts between those who felt that government should simply be an extension or the physical assertion of the power of privileged persons, and those who felt that government should be the impartial servant and protector of every person. As early as 1873, 1823, when the cordwainers, that is the shoemakers of Philadelphia, attempted to organize to improve their working conditions and to urge the adoption of a free public education system for all children, they were charged with conspiracy and thrown in jail. The social history of the past century is deeply scarred with repression as the armed authority of government has been conscripted into the service of industry. Men, women, and children died in the mines and on the gallows before child labor was abolished and coal miners could work and live as men. The demand for the eight-hour day was won only in the blood and bitterness of such events as Haymarket. Government at the disposition of Monopoly crushed the Pullman strike of 1894, imprisoned its leader, launched the great legal career of Clarence Darrow. In 1919, the desperate attempt to organize the steel industry's workers against heavy wage cuts was suppressed by troops in the service of the great steel companies. But you may say this is all history. The owners of today's corporations recognize that interests as such have no legitimate role in government, which is of, by, and for the people. True. Here's a copy, however, of a magazine which few working people ever buy. It's very expensive, and it isn't intended, after all, for working people. It's intended for businessmen. It's called Fortune. This is the December 1959 issue. We bring it to your attention today because Fortune is a more objective publication than most. Businessmen, you know, don't like to be misled, not at a dollar and a quarter a copy and not especially about things which are of practical interest to businessmen, things which may guide money decisions. The lead line of this very frank and somewhat lengthy article sounds a keynote for 1960. It says, the hottest extracurricular activity of many corporate managements today is not golf, but a more complex game, politics. And in six king-size pages, the Fortune article outlines the plans of many of this nation's leading corporations to turn management personnel by the thousands loose in a massive effort at infiltration of both party organizations. The author of the master plan, says Fortune, is Ralph J. Cordiner, chairman of the giant General Electric Corporation. But already the roster of corporations which have picked up the scheme and which are injecting huge sums of money and scores of thousands of managerial personnel into it reads something like a corporate who's who in America. Ford Motor Company, Gulf Oil, American Can, Monsanto Chemical, Republic Steel, Borg Warner, hundreds and hundreds of others. The National Association of Manufacturers and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce are today offering special practical political seminars to any company willing to buy, and hundreds have been willing. Fortune reports indeed that more than 25,000 key corporation personnel have been financed through such seminars and that the demand is increasing out of hand. Well, so much for the Fortune magazine report on the most massive attempt in our history by a relative handful of wealthy men to take over the American political system at its roots. It doesn't take very much imagination, does it, to discern why big business is launching this carefully planned assault on our system. Its basic motivation, and several very important industrialists have been frank enough to admit it, is to extend their special privileges and to cripple the labor unions, both in collective bargaining and in such political activity as working people have from time to time been able to muster. If the plan, however, is successful, our two-party system will be throttled just as surely as price competition has been throttled in basic industry in this country. Many of the corporation executives who've been most vigorous in promoting the organized invasion of both political party structures by corporation personnel 
have been among the loudest denouncers of any form of political activity by organized working people. Now, all fair-minded persons must concede, indeed must insist, that participation in political activity by every citizen, whatever his economic status, is essential, essential to the vitality of our democratic system. Businessmen should be active in politics, and so should every worker who takes seriously the obligations of American citizenship. But when the paid agents of a single corporate interest put on the mask of disinterested civic concern and invade the inner councils of both political parties, then you have the political equivalent of a two-way Trojan horse or a rigged TV quiz. A recent MIT survey indicates that some 96% of all executives employing 10,000 or more workers today are Republican. And Fortune magazine itself admits that its own survey discloses that nearly 80% of all of the nation's top business executives, whatever the size of their companies, are avowedly Republican. The leaders of the current Get Business Into Grassroots Politics campaign, moreover, are without known exception Republicans of the extreme right. So we may well ask then, what is the nose of this corporate camel doing inside the Democratic tent? And you might want to ask yourself this too. Does big business, for the past many years at the very apex of its power, dominating the cabinet, possessing unchallenged access to the ear of the president, extracting profits more fabulous than ever before in the history of our country, dictating policy, and even personnel to key federal regulatory agencies, does big business actually need to subvert the two-party system to find security? Consider for just a moment the degree of political influence and control which big business already exercises. Hundreds of corporation executives today sit in key government positions at the policy level, saturating the cabinet, spreading through every important federal contracting agency. Hundreds of large companies each election year extract so-called voluntary money contributions from management personnel, from thousands of them. In a single evening, but on hundreds of occasions, corporations have bought out the House and filled it in Republican testimonial and fundraising dinners, with the proceeds exceeding at times a quarter of a million dollars. Some weeks ago, in fact, a series of $100 a plate dinners raised in just one night nearly 10 million Republican dollars. In the last presidential campaign, and here's the congressional record if you're interested to show it, 12 wealthy families alone contributed more money, and need we speculate as to which party and its candidates, more money to politics than the entire 15 million man membership of the 140 unions of the AFL-CIO. Corporations have made available entire fleets of limousines, airplanes, helicopters, and other campaign amenities to favored Republican candidates. For decades now, corporations have used various forms of psychological coercion to influence the votes of their workers. Threats of job loss, if so-and-so as a candidate should lose, threats of plant evacuation, persuasion through captive audience brainwashing sessions, and so on. Several major corporations year-round run political newspaper ads and deduct from their taxable incomes the cost of such hidden political contributions as so-called business expenses, which means, of course, that the taxpaying public pays for these ads. Year-round, corporations have ready access to the news and editorial pages of commercial dailies and weekly magazines, which are themselves, of course, big businesses. In recent years, mere influence has been increasingly translated into outright corporate ownership of the media of mass communication. But the corporation's power to mold opinion and to control the flow of public information reaches deep into the future as well. Increasingly, school curricula and educational policy have been bent to conform to and to propagate corporation points of view and political objectives. Actually, business political influence in state and local government is a great deal more aggressive, more widespread, more effective than in federal political affairs. This here is a copy of the NAM News. It's the organ of the National Association of Manufacturers. And it says, for one, Hull Youngblood, who is president of the Southern Steel Company, tells how a group of private businessmen have successfully helped elect conservative candidates to the Texas state legislature for the last 20 years. It says the Texas group first carefully selects candidates with business experience and conservative views. Then it raises the full cost of their campaign and hires a professional campaign manager, publicity man, speech writer, and advertising agency to get them elected. And the system works, says Youngblood. In the past 10 years, his group in Bexar County, Texas, has nominated 30 candidates for the Texas legislature and has elected 26 of the 30. Incidentally, this shouldn't leave any mystery at all as to why and how Texas became a right-to-work state. This, of course, is just the barest outline of the massive extent to which business is in and dominates politics. Now, 
Where does this leave working people and others who want a free electoral system, who want government whose obligation is to people rather than to property? Where does this leave them? COPE, the Committee on Political Education, is the AFL-CIO organization which through its local and state and national branches works to realize labor's legislative objectives. Now, COPE is nobody's Trojan horse. It functions openly and it functions proudly in support of programs which working people want and need to have enacted. Fair labor management legislation, a fair tax system based upon ability to pay, slum clearance, increased old age assistance and adequate health services, civil rights, full employment, adequate unemployment and workman's compensation laws, an increased minimum wage and improved educational opportunities. COPE works to no purpose which does not serve the welfare of all the people. It supports candidates for office, yes, but not based on their party or their group affiliation. COPE supports candidates for office based on what the candidates stand for. Well, it's fairly obvious, isn't it, that a candidate for office who's committed to the kind of objectives I've just mentioned here is not going to receive campaign support from corporation executives. If he receives any help at all to meet the high cost of campaigning, to pay for travel, TV and radio time, billboards, newspaper ads, mailing, telephones, secretarial assistance, that kind of help must come from men and women who work for a living and their friends. And it is part of COPE's job to coordinate the raising of voluntary funds from working people and others who feel that they have a common interest with working people. Organized labor feels that every citizen should contribute something toward financing political activity. But at the same time, that no individual should be permitted to contribute an amount so large as to create undue individual influence. Consequently, the unions of the AFL-CIO, steel workers, textile workers, retail workers, rubber workers, garment workers, auto aircraft and farm implement workers, communications workers, electrical workers, building trades workers, machinists, railroad workers, all of them, ask each member each year to contribute one voluntary dollar to COPE, the Committee on Political Education. In future programs here, we're going to break down and illustrate precisely what happens to that voluntary COPE dollar, what it does for you, what benefits have been, what benefits can in the future be forthcoming from it. Now, for your dollar, you'll receive a receipt and acknowledgement and these publications, Business, Politics, and You, which documents everything said in these programs and more, Labor and Politics, explaining the relationship between politics, wages, and working conditions, a positive program for America, which outlines the legislative program of the AFL-CIO, the Ferrand Bill, a detailed pamphlet describing the plan for hospital insurance for all retirees on Social Security. So, these and the satisfaction of knowing that you have fulfilled an essential obligation of citizenship are yours for just one dollar. If you have comments or suggestions to make concerning political education, please make them to COPE. Your views, your ideas are earnestly sought because COPE, the Committee on Political Education, exists only to serve you, the people. If you feel especially strongly about the need for wider and more intensive political activity by people who work for a living, you may want to contribute more than one dollar, but please not a lot. One dollar from enough of us can work wonders. This program has been presented as a public service by the members of organized labor who work and live in your community.